To millions of viewers, Jeff Smith was a bearded TV chef with middle-class appeal who called himself the frugal gourmet. But when the apron was off, Smith had a monstrous side, one that would lead to his inevitable downfall. Jeff Smith never trained as a chef, but he was always in kitchens, even as a child. He also loved watching his mother cook. In a 1998 interview saved in the Seattle archives, Smith recalled getting his first job in a kitchen as a teen in Pike Place Market, one of the city's most important historical sites. Smith explained that he began washing pans at Rotary Bakery when he was 15 in 1953. He was then promoted to donut cook and would eventually go on to decorate cakes. Throughout Smith's life, Pike Place Market was his reference point. In junior high, he would lie to his mother and take the bus there to watch people. She had prohibited it because the market was a scuzzy area in the 50s. Much later, when he was a famous TV cook, Smith even had his test kitchen in Pike Place. Although PBS filmed The Frugal Gourmet in Chicago, Smith would travel back and forth between the two cities. Seattle is the center of wonderful food. In 1966, University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington, also known as UPS, hired Smith to teach religion and act as the campus chaplain. In an interview with Entertainment Weekly, Smith said of his students, None of them were eating properly. They were eating fried celery and brown rice, garbage like that. So I started giving cooking lessons. Those lessons became the class Food, a Sacrament and Celebration. Today, the UPS website doesn't mention Smith beyond brief references in yearbooks and old copies of the student newspaper, Sound Ideas. Later, a lawsuit filed in Pierce County's Superior Court alleged Smith used his position to pressure male students into sex and named a pupil who also babysat for the Smith family. Smith allegedly attacked the young man repeatedly in their home. It's unclear if his wife, Patty, knew what was going on. When the plaintiffs filed the lawsuit, Patty denied knowledge of her husband's conduct. In 1972, Smith left UPS to open a restaurant and specialty food shop with former students called the Chaplain's Pantry in Tacoma, Washington. It worked as a lunchtime deli, but patrons could make dinner reservations for up to 25 people. Locals loved dining there because of the multi-ethnic foods on the menu. In 1997, one of Smith's restaurant guests was a witness in the lawsuit filed against the cook. The man alleged that he saw something upsetting while dining at the chaplain's pantry with a church group in the 1970s. He'd wanted to purchase peppercorn from Smith, but accidentally stumbled into the dishwashing room there, one of the restaurant's busboys was laying on a table. According to the witness, Smith was allegedly standing over the busboy while kissing him and touching his crotch. This witness remained silent for years. Further allegations signaled the incident was not a love affair between the cook and the busboy, but part of a pattern of grooming. Smith's restaurant coordinated with Stadium High School as part of a career training class. Pupils worked in the Smith's Deli for academic credit and several of them later alleged that the owner used alcohol and threats to sexually assault them. In 1973, Smith had his first foray into television. Noting the success of his restaurant, the local PBS channel KTPS hired him to host a cooking show, Cooking Fish Creatively. In an interview with Entertainment Weekly, the cook recalled having to go around and ask vendors in local markets for free fish since the budget was so small. The set was nothing special, just a brick wall, counter, and ugly refrigerator. However, Smith liked the camera, and the camera liked Smith. Then his wife suggested renaming the show to the Frugal Gourmet, and a legend was born. I want to say right now, my mother is one of your biggest fans. She's she much smarter than you are. The experience Smith gained at KTPS would make him famous later. Reruns of these early shows inspired PBS Chicago to film new seasons of the Frugal Gourmet. Additionally, KTPS put the cook in the local spotlight, setting the stage for him to write and self-publish a collection of recipes. He could publicize his cookbook through his shows and sell it personally at his restaurant. Smith's carefully constructed Tacoma empire tumbled down in 1981 when he was in his early 40s. The primary problem was that the cook needed expensive heart valve surgery and went into debt to pay for it. That same year, an 18-year-old employee of the chaplain's pantry named Clint Smith embezzled funds from the restaurant's business account. Smith filed his complaint with the police, and a judge sentenced Clint to jail for 48 months. Smith found himself in dire financial straits, so in 1982, his only option was to sell the chaplain's pantry. Even after the transaction, Smith still owed $70,000. The cook couldn't sleep at night because of his money problems. 
and even contemplated suicide. He would rise again, though, and to much greater fame than he could have predicted. Smith got lucky when a Chicago station showed reruns of his modest, low-budget cooking show from Tacoma. The show's got so much viewership that Phil Donahue invited the budding celebrity onto his talk show. There, Smith presented his self-published, spiral-bound, locally-printed cookbook. Over the next weeks, viewers mail-ordered 45,000 copies at $4.75 per unit, and his financial troubles became a thing of the past. Those sales numbers got William Morrow and company interested, and in 1984, they published Jeff Smith's The Frugal Gourmet in a hardcover edition. When they published his second volume, both cookbooks took up the first two spots in the New York Times bestseller list. Smith wrote a total of 12 and sold more than 7 million cookbooks total. Despite their popularity with readers, critics from Harper's Magazine and Newsweek gave the books poor reviews. They claimed he plagiarized some recipes and said he used his books to unabashedly sell his line of kitchenware. Today, you can still purchase his cookbooks on Amazon, which range in price from a couple dollars to around $40. Some of them can be purchased new, while others are only available used. Although they were wildly successful when published, today most people seem to have forgotten Smith's books, instead favoring books like The Joy of Cooking and Mastering the Art of French Cooking. Smith's big break came when WTTW created a new series with Smith as the star after his interview with Phil Donahue. They broadcasted the show nationally, and audiences loved The Middle-Aged Star. At the height of its popularity, the show had 15 million viewers a week. Social scientists attributed this to Smith's middle-class appeal, as he featured simple dishes with ingredients available to most people. Other cooking shows at the time tended to show more elaborate recipes intended for higher society, but Smith made cooking accessible to everyone. The steps he described were simple, and he seemed to want everyone to enjoy eating. His show was so appealing that a large number of children watched it. Even Elmo occasionally made guest appearances. It's the heavy Elmo! I'm so glad you're here. Smith needed some help, though. People noticed he occasionally used false information and made mistakes while filming. So he hired a professional chef, Craig Wallum, to assist him on his show and in writing his books. Wallum was well on his way to becoming famous in his own right. But when Smith ran into trouble, the young man's career as a celebrity chef ended. In the beginning, Smith traveled back and forth between Seattle and Chicago. He filmed for three months a year in the Windy City, but tested out new recipes in his Seattle kitchen. Production moved back to Seattle in 1991, and just two years later, Smith's misdeeds would come back to haunt him. In 1993, Smith heard the first whisperings of trouble. However, everything seemed to be under control. Former employee Clint Smith was rocking the boat. The result was easy to predict, though. Smith was an established, well-loved TV personality, while Clint was an ex-convict. It was the word of a minister against that of a criminal. It was easy to believe Clint was simply out to get Jeff back for reporting his theft to the police. Clint wasn't easily deterred, though. He'd been around town talking to at least five Seattle newspapers, alleging Smith had molested him when he worked in the chaplain's pantry as a teenager. His story was that the celebrity had agreed to pay him and another alleged victim $3 million for their silence. They had received cashier's checks for large amounts in 1991, but the payments stopped. Clint produced the checks as evidence when he spoke to reporters. However, no newspaper ran the story since the checks didn't show the source of the money. Clint Smith persisted in his quest for justice. He continued to search for anyone and everyone who would listen to his story. That took him to Mike Siegel's radio show in 1995, where he alleged on air that Smith had abused him as a teenager. As he recounted what had happened, another alleged victim heard his story and called in to allege he had the same experience. Smith laughed off the accusations, calling them ridiculous. No action was taken against him by his TV producers or by the law, and newspapers barely paid attention. It didn't help that Mike Siegel was considered controversial, or that KVI canceled his show just months later because he spread unsubstantiated rumors about Seattle Mayor Norm Rice. While calling into the radio did not ease Clint's trauma, it had an important outcome. The other alleged victim who called into the show decided to take action. He had discovered he wasn't alone and didn't want to keep his secret any longer. Things came to a head in 1997 when seven men filed a lawsuit against Smith. 
One of the alleged victims said he'd struggled with emotional and behavioral disorders after the alleged attacks in his teenage years and had attempted suicide. Then he heard Clint Smith on the radio and felt inspired to act. Clint, the most vocal of the accusers, did not join the lawsuit. None of the plaintiffs ever reported Smith to the police or filed criminal charges against him. Since the crimes occurred 20 years earlier, the statute of limitations meant six of them no longer could. The remaining plaintiff alleged that Smith raped him after picking him up as a hitchhiker in 1992, but chose to join the civil lawsuit instead of pursuing criminal charges. The men hoped that by joining ranks, they would be heard and believed. Although their lawsuit sought financial reparations, their main motivation was to prevent Smith from ever harming another young man. In the end, the lawsuit never went to court. Just days before its date, Smith settled with the plaintiffs. This settlement included no admission of wrongdoing or apology. Until he died six years later in 2004, Smith denied the allegations. Smith also never appeared on TV again as the frugal gourmet. His career as a chef had come to a shameful end. Until I see you again then, this is the frugal gourmet. I bid you peace. Bye-bye. The payout to the plaintiffs likely reduced his fortune greatly, although the numbers were never publicized. He spent the rest of his life wandering around the Pike Place Market and Seattle's seafront, mostly on his own. Whether he should have or not, Smith had an impact. He changed the way people watched cooking on TV. In the end, though, Smith's influence is irrelevant. Any contribution he made could never balance out the damage he caused. Moreover, people will never remember him with the same fondness as they have for other celebrity chefs like Julia Child or Anthony Bourdain. If you or anyone you know has been a victim of sexual assault, help is available. Visit the Rape, Abuse and Incest National Network website or contact Rain's National Helpline at 1-800-656-HOPE. That's 1-800-656-4673.